नमस्कार हेलो एवरीवन वेलकम टू द लेजेनरीज एंड टुडेज एपिसोड वी विल डिस्कस मोर अबाउट वाइन बिकॉज टुडेज आवर गेस्ट इज इज बैकग्राउंड इज वाइन so when you look at the world of wine we majorly distinguish between a old world and a new world so majorly when we say old world we speak about europe and when we speak about new world we talk about rest of the world who are producing wines so when we'll see the new world south africa play a very vital role in the scenario today our guest is from south africa specially Uh, he is from robertson region of uh, south africa philip uh, is the current ceo of van lovren winery van lovren vineyards is one of the leading family owned vineyard from south africa when you look at philip he is a chartered accountant by profession and he joined the business in 1998 and the best part is that in last 15 years he increased the turn around of the company 12 times hi philip welcome to the show hello my love lovely being here and thank you for that introduction so how how are you how is everything there everything's well i mean we're all working within the new realities of of the world and life uh, but but other than that other than covid and and those realities uh, everything's well we've just come out of a very good harvest as you know the southern hemisphere we finish our harvest uh, february to april so yeah it was a very good harvest and uh, so we've got good good building blocks to work with over the next 24 months interesting Uh, so philip i want uh, you to share uh, about yourself and the company with our uh, viewers yeah man like that there's a there's a short version and a long version and uh, i'll try to keep it concise um we're a, we're a family business as you mentioned we we try to um, communicate ourselves as a, as a leading family private business in south africa it's been in the family since 1937 started up with my grandfather as a as a very small farming unit uh, diverse fruits etc uh, and then when my dad and my uncle joined in the 60s they started making wine uh, most of it was fortified wine we didn't have cold fermentation at that stage where we could produce the quality wines we wanted to and uh, then in 1980 we launched the Van Looferen brand um it was named after a lady from the Netherlands that came to South Africa in 1699 she was the ancestor of my grandmother so that was the the relationship uh, to the name and and that's really where our path of growth started uh, in 1980 when we converted from a production driven business to a trademark driven business being supported by by production Uh, and it's actually yeah just been 40 years old the brand and um, and yeah in that 40 years there's a there's an, another few stories to tell with regards to to the different brands and and how we've grown over these years uh, as a family and um, and at the moment the third generation very much involved uh, we leading the business me, me myself Philip as you've mentioned my brother Neil he's on the production side farming my cousin Henny he's uh, also doing a uh, a last part of our production for us and then my cousin Basil which heads up uh, our winery and logistics department uh, as as the cellar master so so we would be the the four directors of the company but uh, as you mentioned we've been very fortunate to grow quite a bit and significantly over the last 15 years and uh, our our team and our employees and our colleagues have also expanded during this time and it's it's also learned us a lot more about running a business other than just being hands on and operationally involved you know philip while you were talking now you know behind my mind uh, I, i can see those pictures when i visited uh, when lovren last time and uh, the vineyard is fantastic i think you that wine tasting facility is also really nice i think you must uh, tell more about that uh, christina that uh, restaurant that you have uh, next to the wine uh, wine tasting facility yeah as, as i mentioned 
as I mentioned, Malay, and yeah, you were here, we've been here twice now, and that's how we were introduced to the Indian market by, by WSA. And uh, yeah, thank you for that again. But but yes, we're a, we're a trademark business now, and we as we all refer to the pyramid or the triangle where you've got uh, the high value ultra premium wines at the top, and at the bottom you've got your more volume driven popular premium wines, and in the middle you've got lifestyle, heritage, traditional. Uh, and, and all those, and, and we believe that we can play in all these these different sectors. It's almost as if the wine industry caters for quite a few different consumers, and um, and depending on obviously what the price point is, what the style is, and what the quality is, you will you will um, knock on some consumers' door with with one brand and others others with another. Um, and yes, wine tourism is a big part of of building wine brand, building those stories. We're about 150 kilometers from Cape Town, a 90-minute drive, direct east, uh, just for your guests to give it a bit of perspective. And uh, yes, tourism uh, is, is, I think, one of your, your best ways of creating the awareness around your brand. And, and with that, you've got the wine tasting facility, we've got the historic garden, and then we've got the Christina restaurant also within that. Uh, so. So we, we, we try and keep the, the customer or the visitor or the tourist here for as long as possible, let them experience who and what we are about, and, and hopefully they would, in the process, fall in love with the wines. Um, a lot of local tourists, obviously, from South Africa uh, at the moment, not many foreign tourists, uh, but yeah, maybe in a year or two's time when everything normalizes, Cape Town will become popular for, for international visitors, and, and so will we also get that benefit of, of visitors coming to, to Van Lofren. Nice. You know, Philip, we are in 2021. And just 21 years before, in 2000, the year 2000, you started something really spectacular. You, along with your three cousins, you started a brand or you coined a brand called The Four Cousins. And today, uh, this is uh, one of the highest selling uh, still wine or the brand in glass bottle. How this idea came into your mind about four cousins and how is it doing now? Yeah, you're quite right, Malay. It's, it's been a fantastic story for us, a fantastic, fantastic building block as part of our, our growth phase. Um, yeah, we, we, the four of us joined the business all in the 90s, the mid 90s. And then, uh, yeah, we just came up with this idea that, uh, I mean, we, we had sufficient production and we didn't have a large enough market with our Van Lofren brand at that stage. And we identified that there was a consumer out there that wanted to enjoy wine, but was not necessarily as serious as wine as, as many people or many consumers or many wine pundits would, would think. Um, and we launched the brand Four Cousins, us being four cousins, obviously two sets of brothers, just we got involved as, as young men in the business at that, that time. Um, we launched it in a 1.5 liter Magnum, which was quite unique. Uh, at that, that stage, it was working in the Americas, but in, in our world of wine, it was only premium wine that you got in Magnums, sold at auctions and maybe for gifting. And, uh, and, and we were the first wine available, Four Cousins then, as a commercial proposition uh, in a 1.5 liter. And I think the, the size played a role. South Africa was in a good economic growth phase. There were a lot of new wine consumers entering the market. And the other point of difference was that we made it in a sweeter style. So we used very good quality wine, but we sweetened it with grape must or grape juice. So slightly lower alcohol, but the palate was sweeter and it was, as I can almost say, uh, unpretentious. Um, and I think all these factors, the, the bottle, the quality, the style of the wine, and the name Four Cousins resonated with the consumer. Uh, there are a lot of wine names out there in the world, as we all know, and many of them aren't easy to pronounce or remember. And Four Cousins was maybe just spot on at the time, and that definitely also played a part. And then the last thing that we does, did was we actually put our four faces on the label, which is in terms of market research or MBA guidance or normal marketing principles, not not necessarily the right thing to do. And we got a bit of resistance initially. Uh, I didn't want to put my face on a bottle of wine. I said, let's do a black and white drawing or abstract 
drawing or something, and the other guy said, "No, let's go with a with a picture." And it was before technology. I mean, before mobile phones. Um, and we literally went to our photo albums and we cut and pasted four four pictures. And that's our four cousins. The the label and the bottle and the style and the packaging evolved. Um, it, it, it took a while to to take off, um, but there was initial signs that it was something. Uh, that there was something brewing, if I can put it that way. And uh, launching in 2000, I think in 2005, it started five years later in the local market. It really got a big following that 2005 to 2008 season, if I can put it that way. And yeah, we became the number one selling brand in glass in South Africa, which was phenomenal for us. Um, and it, it awakened all the big uh, competitors, as you can imagine. They, everybody suddenly wanted to sit around the table and produce a similar wine, a similar style wine positioning. Um, so, so the early phase, the first eight to 10 years was almost the, the easy phase, if I can put it that way. The, the past 10 years has been slightly more difficult. The brand is still strong, still doing well. But yeah, they, there's a lot of competitors in that, that environment now and many playing on, on price, um, trying to, to have a slice of that, that market share. Uh, I, I tested this wine first time in Hong Kong and believe me, next five minutes I was very clear that this wine is going to come to India soon. Uh -huh. you know, for me, for me, Four Cousins is like uh, a stepping stone to the world of wine because it is crisp, it is young and uh, with a uh, you know, natural sweet uh, variant, the, the alcohol percentage is 8 to 8.5 percent. So it's a great pocket friendly wine and which can be easily a stepping stone to the world of wine. So thank you so very much for producing this wine for us. Yeah, thank you. I, I, I agree, Malay, that, yeah, I mean, with WSA, we brought it to India. I think it's still in, in its infant shoes. And um, yeah, if we can replicate what's happened in South Africa and other parts of Africa at the moment uh, in India, uh, yes, I think the consumer is there, the specific consumer that you're referring to, young, uh, consumer, women, ladies, uh, people that want something uh, more palatable. Absolutely, it, it is a it is an unpretentious wine, and it is a stepping stone for, for many into the world of wine, as you as you say. Philip, uh, for generations you were producing wine, but when you became the CEO, now you have cream liqueur in your portfolio, you have beer in your portfolio, you have spirits in your portfolio. So, what is that thought behind? Yeah, I think there's there's two answers to that story, Malay. We we in wine, obviously, wine is in the liquor. So we said we understand wine, um, and we and we tried our hand at, at these products that you've mentioned now. Some of them, the beer, we do in a very craft, small niche basis. Uh, the spirits, we've tried, but the competitor set is too strong. And we know all the international brands on brandy and and whiskey. So we've actually taken a, a small step back on that. Uh, we we're focusing on craft gin. So uh, I think the, the craft side of, of the world outside of wine is where, where, we, where we are finding ourselves um, to, to try and build something commercial on, in that sphere and compete with the multinationals out there. It's, it, at this stage, not necessarily plausible. Uh, but yeah, the, the other exciting parts which you started with was the cream liqueurs. Uh, cream liqueur out of South Africa and Africa has, has done historically very well. And, and yeah, that, that's a very exciting prospect as part of our diversification. So, so yes, you can diversify into agriculture, uh, on agriculture as we do with, with some fruits that we plant. But uh, in, in liquor, we also want to diversify within the wine sector and outside of the wine sector into other, let's say, call it smaller niche, niche markets at this stage. Okay, Philip. Uh year 2020 and we never expected we never thought we never heard about something like covid 19. you know if i i'll say myself i was in february 2020 i was traveling in uh, wine paris so you know we never expected covid will be that huge and it will give such a dent to uh, the mankind it's not about any any country or any subcontinent or any continent in particular, but it is a dent to the whole mankind. So when you heard uh, COVID for the first time, 
what was your reaction yeah i've i've, I've got a personal take on that i don't think we have to go into that i think our, all our opinions have, have maybe changed over the past 14 months understanding the reality is better but let's focus on the on the 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 business side and the impact that it has had and, and still has um, when when we heard of it initially say january february last year 2020 maybe brush it off and yeah i thought it was going to something seasonal flu will pass pass on um and then somewhere early in march it was my last travels i, I think i was up in johannesburg coming back from nigeria and uh, it was 13 march i can remember the date it was the friday the 13th ironically and then the, the news and the noise in south africa was getting louder and bigger and that monday morning the 16th uh, we the four cousins and directors actually had a, a meeting about about covid specifically i'm mean, not understanding it then but but certainly identifying the potential risks on the tourist industry on consumption patterns uh, on, on on and on our own business so so we we were i th- i think we can say that we were good at our reaction because we were we were quick uh, we were nimble we are agile we were adjustable adaptable and literally before our president later that month on the 23rd of march made his first speech and saying that we were going into a hard lockdown on the 28th of of march we've already we had already implemented quite significant um uh what can i say operational changes or realities to our our business and um and and so so that that has stood us very very strong during last year Uh, as you might know um, or, or maybe not your listeners we South Africa specifically we were closed the liquor industry for four and a half months out of the the following 12 months so we were almost closed for 40% of normal trading trading hours so liquor was closed down as part of the hard lockdowns and and at that point when we made these decisions we didn't know that was coming but um but yes i think the fact that we given the size of our, our company given the fact that we're private uh and we're a very flat structure we could make decisions very quickly and and those of 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 most have come in very helpful over the over the past 12 months uh i think business that suffered big time so you yourself he is not only the ceo of van lovren but you are uh, you know director and uh, in senior position of many other uh, south african organization like uh, wine of south africa or that uh, bkk uh, that bottling unit and all those so you know how you people really manage the situation manage the dent yeah i i think it it um, your your business i mean it, it was interesting how quick it was we we knew we were going to lockdown but the day before lockdown we heard that liquor was closing so suddenly you need to close your restaurants your tasting facilities your bottling plants you're not allowed to transport wine bottle stores are closing so literally it's like a, a light switch on and off and um yeah we we acted i think well we communicated well with our people our colleagues our teams and um as i said we were already in the mode then of of implementing some of these ideas the the impact on the larger industry everybody potentially not as as quick as we were and um and uh, and and the industry definitely is feeling the brunt of that as we speak I apologize for the noise as a truck loading just outside my my window but it will be gone now and the and the the the, the impact of all this has meant that we are sitting in South Africa with a significant surplus of wine uh, we've had the 2020 harvest i mentioned the 2021 harvest which was good uh, we are sitting on more wine today than we've had ever had in our history in tank and this is obviously obviously needs to go go somewhere at at some point um i believe that our business the way we've acted as as put us at the front of that wave i can put it that way and there is a wave that is going to break on the industry and uh unfortunately not all businesses might survive it uh, due to the fact that we are sitting with these huge amounts uh, of of stock 
uh, wines in South Africa in April, May last year, we were closed. We weren't allowed to transport wine, so we couldn't export wine. So that was a further knock-on effect on the on the local local market. And um, and yeah, uh, BBK are, are bottling plants. I mean, we, we bottle for 40 different wineries. Um, I, th- I think the important thing out of all of this is that we can, with pride, say that we managed to maintain all our staff. We kept everybody employed. Um, we could see out this crisis um, within the South African environment in wine, and uh, that we are now hopefully bouncing back. I wouldn't say to where we were. I don't. I don't, also don't want to say we are bouncing back to a new normal. We need to bounce back to a new future, and exactly what that future is going to entail, time will tell. But we are at least. Um, aware about what's going on around us and then we can due to the fact that we can adapt and be be quick agile nimble that that is playing to our to our benefit uh philip this show is not only about the end consumer but this is also for that small and medium scale industries for those owners uh, so I, i want to know uh, from your perspective what should be the message for everybody that what we should do, how, you know, we are naming it COVID, but it, it can be anything. So for, for future purpose also, what will be your message for everybody that how we people will be, uh, you know, pandemic ready uh, for our industry? We definitely, I would say we are a, a large medium business. We're not at the large scale. And, you know, Malay, it, it impacts all of us. And I think your business model before this pandemic and before this black swan event uh, plays a crucial part in terms of how your business model will play out going forward. And um, and we all have our different business models and been based on different markets or different brands or different positionings. But I think the the the, the wineries in, in, in the South African environment anyway, and, and it could relate to other businesses in other, other countries, um, if your business model was sound and you had an integrated business model where you, in our case, where we produce, where we uh, process and where we market to a specific customer, uh, not much has changed about that other than maybe regulatory changes or traveling that's restricted. Uh, and there's always alternatives available. So I believe the businesses, big or small, that have, have a market for their product. I think they will be best suited for the future in wine. I think wineries that that sell wine in bulk predominantly to excess countries when and, and how required, uh, to local wholesalers when and, and how required, um, they might be in for for a bit of distress and and concerns in their in their model. So so definitely one of the things that's standing strong for us is that we we believe we understand our customers. We believe we understand the world of wine to a large extent. Um, we we learn all the time, but at, but we can at any time consider the, the alternatives uh, when when a black swan event like like this occurs. And an example maybe is when we were closed down last year for four and a half months. We could very quickly, not easily, but very quickly, we could actively pursue the online channel. And that has been amazing for us over the past 12 months as a, as a let, let's say, can I say a softener for the reality of, of, of lockdown. We, we could make that channel active. We could, we could develop it from, from a small base to something significant, which we continuously will be working on. Uh, we do non-alcoholic wines, almost zero and no, absolute zero de-alcoholized wines. We, in our local prohibition, we did actually was good for us to be able to market and sell that as a proposition uh, to customers. So, so yes, I, I, I think any size business, depending on your model and your market, uh, those with a market will definitely be be better off today than those not with a market uh, historically. So, you know, our industry, especially alcohol industry in this part of the world is full of myth. And I, I feel the same for uh, South Africa also. So uh, tell me uh, your personal uh, experience, uh, if you bust any of the myth uh, in our industry. 
But like, yes, funny one of these is obviously I'm in the normal widths about the red wine paradox, etc. But I think the, the the interesting one that relates to to us and the four cousins is that uh, it's a myth and it's it's almost an urban legend in conversations. Um, and my mother attended a function many years ago, and, and there the story was that one of the, the cousins had passed on, or the other one is that the four cousins are actually just they don't exist. They just uh, uh, function of the imagination. So, so yeah, that definitely is a, is a, a exciting myth about about the. I wouldn't say exciting, but a, a myth about the brand for cousins. Uh, yeah, we are, as we said earlier, two sets of brothers. We are very much fortunate to be in the business. We're all alive, and um, and yeah, hopefully uh, that that might continue for a, for a while to come. So. So yeah, now there, there there is a myth from the from the four cousins consumer that that we actually don't exist. And when when consumers meet us and and uh, and have that opportunity, it's it's amazing the celebrity status that we have because of the fact that we've put our names and our faces on a on a brand. So so yeah, that's a I think that's a wonderful part of the of the the brand strength of four cousins. The four real cousins, right? Four real cousins, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Nice. We, 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 we unfortunately not as young as we were. You'll see the pictures on the bottle. That was taken 22 years ago. So we we're struggling to keep up with time. Yeah. So that we'll maybe bring out a, a matured cousin red wine at some point or something like that. We'll still figure it out. <laughs> so it's no more a myth. Four cousins stands for four real cousins, right? Yep, absolutely, no myth and no, and no urban legend. But it's a good story. <laughs> <laughs> Interesting. Awareness and alcohol, awareness and wine, I think they go hand on hand. So, uh, you know, it is very, very crucial for us to spread the awareness about alcohol or to spread the awareness about wine. So, uh, you know, it's not only for the end consumer, but for the trade also. So how you play around this awareness thing for your brand? May it be Venlo brand, may it be Four Cousins, may it be Christina or anyone. Yeah, you, you've, you're very right, and it's ex- extremely important that we we need to be aware of what's happening in our own world of wine, but also in the larger world of wine. And part of the conversation we've linked onto with COVID, I think the fact that we we are aware, acutely aware, of our surroundings, of our realities, but also the larger South African market and international market, uh, means that we can make important decisions not just based on on a whim, but we can we can do it with informed knowledge. Um, and again, we can we can utilize that by adapting and, and being being agile quickly. And I think what what we do within our business model is uh, many wineries speak of innovation all the time, and you obviously innovate out of the fact that you are aware of certain things that are happening. But innovation could can also be a, a some, sometimes used too much or too easy. I think um, we, we like to refer to it more as entrepreneurial skill, where we try and unlock innovation, because if innovation does not lead to a commercial success, it's just a grandiose idea, if I can put it put it that way. Um, but by being aware of of what's happening, as I've said, around us, we, we, we can uh, venture into avenues such as organic wine, the non-alcoholic wines. In South Africa, we've got our own empowerment story with regards to transformation of political history. So so, so all, all these realities, uh, uh, consumer realities and market realities, and maybe even political realities, uh, play, play a role in your decision making when you want to innovate and take that to the table as an entrepreneurial and commercial success. So now, Philip, uh, tell me, what is your uh, personal uh, choice of alcohol, but not the alcohol you are producing? My, my immediate thought is goes to a non-alcoholic beer, and it's, it's one of the popular ones. It's Heineken. So, I've the last two years I've gone through, done my own six weeks of, of a sabbatical of, of wine and alcohol, and. Um, and outside of Alufren, I would say it's a non-alcoholic beer of of Heineken. Interesting. Mm. Uh, you know, 
this this episode is powered by Champagne Laurier Perrier. So, uh, t- tell me your experience about Laurier Perrier. Yeah, it, it's not something that we we find regularly in South Africa. It is available. I've en- I've enjoyed it myself. I mean, it's a rich tradition. I think uh, 200 years old. The the Laurier Perrier brand or the the estate, I mean, elegant finesse. Premium quality, so yeah, it shouts shouts all the right right words and, and and noises with regards to what what they propose as a brand to to their customers. So yeah, just just respect for for what they've achieved. Nice, I think this is one of the uh, image wise they are one of the best uh, uh, champagne from uh, for the world from yeah. France. Yeah. Is it, if I might ask you, is it a, a popular in India? Yeah, it's very popular okay. in India. Yeah, yeah. Uh, last but not the least, Philip. As for you, what is the definition of a successful brand? Wow, yeah, that is a interesting one. Um, someone someone mentioned to me in a discussion a month or so ago that a, a, a brand is a promise kept, and I and I liked what I heard. Um, and, and yes, in the world of of wine and the world of consumerism, there are so many brands. So so to try and differentiate differentiate your brand from from the competitions or from another region or or, or, or world. Um, in wine is 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 not that easy. So if if I can if we can start with keeping our promise, if, if our innovative idea uh, got created into a a product that we want to sell to the consumer, we need to be confident with that message and proposition all the time. Be that our premium Cristina range, be that Van Lofren, be that for cousins as we discussed, or be that an alcoholic uh, product. So. Um, So yes, a successful brand is 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 that a promise kept, but it's also also something that can add value to your business. Um, if it unfortunately needs to be commercialized, um, if it, you can't commercialize it, then uh, yeah, we we'll, would have to have locked our, our doors earlier during COVID um, or, or completely. So yeah, a brand can can not only be a, a lovely story. It has to be a lovely story, but but also with commercial commercial value. That's interesting. Nice to know your view about a successful brand, uh, Philip. Uh, thank you so very much for your time, and uh, interesting to know your views about uh, what we discussed. Legendaries is you know a platform where we keep you know motivating people towards the brighter side of the same situation. So thank you for your uh, uh, for for your insight uh, for sharing with us and looking forward to see you uh, in person soon. Thank you very much. Hopefully soon, Elijah Malai. Thank you for having me, and it was lovely chatting to you. And uh, yeah, good luck with your program. Thank you. Ciao. Yes. Bye bye. Bye bye.